The Notorious Chateau Marmont. Part 1. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. Eight two two one Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, California isn't much to look at from the outside. Shaded by a red brick wall and thick hedges, the driveway is easy to miss, a nondescript path lost in the busy Sunset Strip. But make the turn and you'll find yourself at the base of the Chateau Marmont, a modest hotel, at least by LA standards. 63 rooms packed with nearly 100 years of dense, scandalous, heartbreaking, and inspiring Hollywood history. History that feels, as cliche as it sounds, larger than life. But it is. Chateau Marmont biographer Sean Levy, whom we will talk to later in this episode, gives us some exciting context for the Chateau, a history that, if it had its own biopic, an exec would feel was a bit too on the nose. Quote, from Greta Garbo to Howard Hughes, Betty Davis to Marilyn Monroe, Jim Morrison to Tony Randall, Johnny Depp to Lindsay Lohan, Chateau Marmont has drawn the most iconoclastic and outlandish personalities, the site of wild parties and scandalous liaisons, of creative breakthroughs and marital breakdowns, of one-night stands and days-long parties, of famous triumphs and untimely deaths. This Halloween, Ghost Town decided to check into the Chateau Marmont, literally, discovering with the help of historians, writers, friends, psychics, and even an astrologer, the exciting future, notorious past, and ghosts, both literally and figuratively, that lurk everywhere in between. Today, we'll delve into part one of the hotel's fascinating history with some of our favorite Chateau sources and historians, including Sean Levy and Mark Rosso. Next week, on October 25th, we'll talk through the second half of the hotel's scandalous history and what its future might hold. And our final episode, Friday the 27th, we'll talk about actually staying there, engaging with the history of the hotel, and what otherworldly forces we might have had the pleasure of encountering with an astrological read by Vanderpump Rules cast member and master astrologer, Ali Luber, and a chilling seance with friend of the podcast from Ghost Hunters, The Travel Channel, and more, psychic medium and good witch Patty Negri. It's truly been a blast, and we can't wait to share what we learned and experienced. But without further ado, part one of our Halloween three-part series on the notorious Chateau Marmont. We're calling this historic first part by the Chateau's nickname, The Castle on the Hill. In 1926, Fred Horowitz had a dream. As a prominent attorney and man about town, he witnessed the development of the quiet, farmhouse-dappled Hollywood in the newish state of California. The construction of the 12-story Roosevelt Hotel, and beyond that, the burgeoning downtown Los Angeles. Quite simply, he wanted to be a part of it. Horowitz had recently traveled to the Loire Valley in France, and had happened upon the Chateau d'Amboise, a gothic castle where Leonardo da Vinci is buried. He thought, What if I built a seven-story apartment complex with the same gothic grandeur as the chateau along the Loire, right here in Hollywood? A year later, he did. In 1927, Horowitz commissioned his brother-in-law, European-trained architect Arnold A. Weitzman, to design the seven-story residence based on his many photos from the Chateau d'Imbois. In January of 1929, the building was in its final stages of construction, and it needed a name. Horowitz always knew he wanted to name the building Chateau something, an homage to good times at the Chateau d'Amboise. Still, Chateau Sunset or Chateau Hollywood didn't have that ring. But lucky for Horowitz, he had to look just a bit south to find the name that would excite him, the little winding road that bisected the building, called Marmont Lane. Marmont Lane was named after Percy Marmont, an English silent film actor who worked in Los Angeles about 10 years before. He was said to have been a favorite screen actor of a young and -and up-and-coming director named Alfred Hitchcock, but I digress. Marmont had the je ne sais quoi, and Horowitz was sold. On February 1st, 1929, the much-anticipated Chateau Marmont opened its doors to any and all potential renters. But at this point, West Hollywood was not what it is now, and according to Sean Levy, best-selling author of The Castle on Sunset, the idea of building something of that stature in that location felt at worst reckless and at best, naive. Yeah, it was a crazy idea. It was a luxury apartment building built along Sunset Boulevard in a stretch of Sunset Boulevard that was a dirt road. The pavement ended at uh, Laurel Canyon Drive and began again 
at the Beverly Hills city limit. And this bit of Sunset Boulevard was not, I, I believe it had been named West Hollywood, but it wasn't incorporated. So it was an unincorporated stretch of land, which meant it was patrolled not by LAPD or Beverly Hills PD, but by the county sheriffs. And if you look at a map, it's pretty far from other places that the county would have been policing. So it was kind of lawless. Um, it had roadhouses and brothels and gambling joints. And during Prohibition, there were speakeasies. So it was a dodgy bit of, of, of territory. And it was a luxury building that opened in February 1929, you know, eight months before the stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. The chateau's grand opening didn't get the reception that Horowitz anticipated. In fact, a residence at the chateau would be a hard sell for renters. The high prices, erratically shaped rooms, and shabby furniture weren't much of a draw. It seemed though Horowitz had spared no expense with the construction, but the interior design was sorely lacking. That and the aforementioned economic hit of the Great Depression made the chateau a bit doomed as a rental property from the start. Doomed, or set up for a chaotic Hollywood-style path to greatness? You decide. Just two years after it opened its doors and only partially occupied, Horowitz was persuaded to sell the building to studio executive Albert E. Smith for a meager $750,000 cash. That's equivalent to a little more than $15 million today. If that still seems high, consider the median listing home price in Los Angeles in August of 2023 is at $1.2 million. Sobering, isn't it? Smith was a movie producer for Vitagraph Films, one of the many studios who had moved out west to avoid legal ramifications for infringing on various copyrights. Still, in LA, it became one of the most famous silent motion picture studios in the world, helping launch the careers of Rudolph Valentino, Helen Hayes, Mo Howard of the Three Stooges, and the first animal celebrity, a border collie named Gene. But in 1925, Vitagraph was still fighting legal battles and sold to Warner Brothers for $735,000. Yes, I know, almost exactly the price of the chateau. Coincidence? I actually have no idea. Smith got out of the movie business and smartly bought the chateau, having a new vision for the property, a place for travelers coming to LA to see the blossoming city. He was smart and correct in that thought. The 1932 Summer Olympics was being held in Los Angeles, which drew more people to need both long- and short-term housing. There was a lot of work to be done, and Smith knew he needed a presence to manage all of this change and cater to what would now be a steady stream of guests. So he hired former silent film actor Ann Little to be the face of the chateau. In taking the job as manager, Little had some stipulations, a suite for her ailing mother and a luxury glow-up to the rooms, rooms that I can only imagine were pretty dumpy and somewhat depressing to stay in. Smith agreed, and Little refinished the rooms with kitchens and living rooms, decorating each space with antiques from Depression-era estate sales. Each room had individual character and intrigue all its own, and finally, some glamour inside as well as outside. But at this point, the Chateau wasn't getting nearly the same amount of guests and press as the Beverly Wilshire, the Ambassador, or the Beverly Hills Hotel. There were rich people staying there, sure, but not famous rich people. But that all changed with residents Nalita Choate Thomason and her husband, wealthy jeweler and amateur film director Carl H. Thomason. Together, their dinner parties would be the foundation of the Chateau as a social hub, a place to see, be seen, and most importantly, talked about. Why? Because Nalita Thomason wasn't just a wealthy man's wife who liked to throw raucous dinner parties. She was a crime reporter turned gossip columnist who wrote under the pseudonym Paula Payne. Payne wrote about the people at her parties and her chateau neighbors, including Jean Acker, the first wife of Rudolph Valentino, film star Mary Astor, and Clara Clemens, Mark Twain's daughter, who moved in after the death of her concert pianist husband. It was fun, sure, but not as fun as when, in September 1933, the first really famous celebrity unpacked her bags at the chateau, 22-year-old Jean Harlow. Oh, you're going to find out about how heavy hitter Jean Harlow experienced the place, I promise, right after this break. Jean Har Angie is your home for everything home, and they've made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise that you need. Angie has over 20 years of home service experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. 
Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly. Which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few steps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your own home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. You can live out your MasterChef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside. Repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. Paula was at 22 the hottest celebrity in Hollywood and unpacked her bags at the Chateau with husband number three, Harold Rawson. But it wasn't exactly all fun and newlywed games for the actor. Harlow was still being talked about in connection to the death of her second husband, MGM executive Paul Byrne, who died mysteriously of a gunshot wound just two months after the two were married. Byrne was rumored to be a sexual deviant, a philanderer, a pervert, and might have even had a murder-suicide pact with another woman. Of course, all unsubstantiated. But what led more fuel to the rumor mill was the note found near his body when police discovered it at their shared home. The note said, mysteriously, quote, Last night and was only a comedy. A 2009 biography of Byrne asserted that Byrne was, in fact, murdered by a former lover and that MGM executives rearranged the crime scene to make it appear that Byrne had killed himself, which means you can still like Jean Harlow as she is not, to my knowledge, a murderer. But I digress. Harlow and Ross needed a place to be a married couple, away from the public, and especially away from Harlow's micromanaging mother, also named Jean. So they took a $250 a month remodeled suite, rooms 22 and 23, and got on with their lives. Still, at the end of January, 1934, Harlow had taken up with Hollywood hunk Clark Gable, and Rawson and Harlow divorced and both moved out. Sadly, Jean Harlow would live for just three more years, dying on June 7, 1937, from acute kidney failure. For years, rumors circulated about Harlow's death. Some claimed that her mother had refused to call a doctor because she was a staunch Christian scientist, or that Harlow herself had declined treatment. Others think her kidneys were weakened by a childhood disease, her death certificate lists the cause of death as, quote, acute respiratory infection, acute nephritis, and uremia. I like to envision the young Jean Harlow walking through the halls of the chateau, healthy, in love, one of many who came and went from the chateau in those early days. Harry Cohen, head of Columbia Pictures, was another one, keeping a suite on retainer to entertain his young protégés, who in turn would invite over people like John Barrymore, who would often come over after fights with his fourth wife, or Humphrey Bogart, who would come over after a fight with his third wife. Also around that time, Viennese actor Hedwig Keisler would also stop in during this time, newly renamed by studio execs as palatably exotic Hedy Lamar. And then there was Billy Wilder, who came to the U.S. on a six-month visa and made the Chateau Marmont his home. A diehard Chateau man, Wilder was noted as saying, quote, I would rather sleep in a bathroom than in another hotel. And he's not joking when he said that. Between 1934 and 1937, Wilder made the Chateau his home, first staying in the cheapest room, essentially a closet, then rooming with actor Peter Lorre, and then, somewhat disturbingly, he rented a kind of waiting area off the women's lobby restroom. Quote, it was a small room, Wilder noted, but it had six toilets. Despite all these famous faces, however, the Chateau was still having a rough run of actually making a profit, and the hotel business had some incredibly stiff competition. So in 1942, Albert Smith put the Chateau on the market, selling it for $350,000, less than half of what he paid back in 1931, to German investor E.O. Bredauer, who not only funded films in the Weimar Republic and had money to spend, but was a progressive, a scientist, an original anti-fascist agitator. So Erwin Bredauer was a uh, German banker who had um, studied chemistry uh, in the 19-teens and 20s in, in Germany. His family were very wealthy. They owned banks. He actually contributed to scientific papers that were published uh, under Albert Einstein's byline. And, you know, he was kind of a brilliant man. And he went into the family banking business and he was very political. He was um, basically, we would think of him today as a liberal or progressive 
in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Though the chateau had a more European air when World War II hit, it would become a place that wasn't known for luxury, but for its open-door policy to anyone who needed refuge. During this time, the hotel served as an air raid shelter, housing exiled Habsburg royals and Thelma Viscountess Furness, a mistress to King Edward, and who herself would introduce him to the woman he would abdicate the throne for, Wallace Simpson. Perhaps more notably than that and Marilyn Monroe's stay in the late 40s would be integration. When Bredauer bought the chateau, he didn't even realize that it was a racially segregated space. As soon as he found out about it, he changed the policy overnight. And Duke Ellington became the first black guest at Chateau Marmont and stayed there for several months while he was working on films and, and writing some music. And then it became a place where, you know, Miles Davis, Harry Belafonte, Lena Horne, all the New York um, and European Josephine Baker, um, all, all the black entertainers who came to L.A. would stay at Chateau Marmont because it was much more convenient to their work than staying in South Central and driving, you know, 20 miles each way. This really definitively progressive move would break the longstanding color line in Hollywood and Beverly Hills hotels. The spirit of inclusivity carried into the 1950s, when celebrities like John Wayne and Desi Arnaz would come to drink and get away from their wives. Are you sensing a pattern here? And Betty Davis, from her fourth husband. Women got get away too. Montgomery Clift hunkered down in room 36 after his 1956 car accident, making an appearance onto the terrace totally naked to scream obscenities at guests and onlookers. Also at the Chateau, high-profile gay men including Anthony Perkins and Gore Vidal would be able to express their homosexuality within the hotel's protected rooms and corridors. It was a space where celebrities could be themselves. Even Grace Kelly would try to persuade the desk clerks to give her the room numbers of men she fancied. And Warren Beatty and Grace Kelly would probably have gotten along, as Beatty, in his early Hollywood days, was also into having fun at the hotel. While handsome, during his first stay, he wasn't able to pay his bills and was asked to leave. He would later come back and stay at the hotel with his fiance, Joan Collins, on the studio's dime. Actor Boris Karloff, a longtime on-again, off-again resident, was maybe the outlier of the group. He loved a quiet stay and was beloved by the staff, making friends with all of the Chateau's employees and shaking martinis for the manager. Meanwhile, New York actors like Jack Lemmon, Montgomery Clift, and Joanne Woodward would create a community of New Yorkers at the hotel. Greta Garbo, an occasional guest who stayed under the name Harriet Brown, was rumored to have owned the Chateau Marmont at the time. She didn't. But her room, Penthouse 64, was also where business magnate and movie maker Howard Hughes liked to isolate, and where parts of the insane film adaptation of Gore Vidal's Myra Breckenridge was shot. Later, Barbara Streisand, Warren Beatty, and comedian Buddy Hackett would all stay in room 64. And they also all stayed in room 16, right next to the room that we stayed in. But more on that later. In 1952, writer-director Nicholas Ray moved into Bungalow 2 after finding his wife, Gloria Graham, in bed with his own 13-year-old son. Ray was developing a small, somewhat experimental project called Rebel Without a Cause, and in 1954 was hosting loose, boozy casting workshops with young actors James Dean, Dennis Hopper, and 16-year-old Natalie Wood, who, though just a couple months older than his son, he began sleeping with. That part is all very gross. But that being said, the movie would become Film Canon, released on October 27, 1955. Unfortunately, Dean wouldn't be there to enjoy its overwhelming reception. On September 30, 1955, James Dean crashed his Porsche Spider on his way to an auto race in Salinas, California, and was killed. Fast forward three years later to 1958, Betty Davis almost burned the place down when she fell asleep one night with a lit cigarette in her mouth, watching one of her own movies on the hotel's TV. Actor Lou Jacoby, staying right next door, saw smoke coming out of the window and alerted the hotel, which had to immediately be evacuated. And the brushes with death would continue. In 1959, Errol Flynn stayed in Bungalow 3, a week before he died of a heart attack. This, and another very high-profile death we'll talk about later, would arguably make Bungalow 3 the most famous room in the hotel. But for now, this is where we'll say goodbye to the Chateau of the 1950s and its then-owner, E.O. Bredauer, and move into the era of William Weiss, who would take over the Chateau and drive it into disrepair, all to the backdrop of a very chaotic, very iconic, mid-century Sunset Strip. Join us Wednesday for part two of Ghost Town's three-part Halloween series on the Chateau Marmont, heading into the 60s and beyond. And then next Friday, for the final episode in the series, where we'll recount our surreal stay overnight in the hotel. In fact, stay tuned after the credits to hear a little bit of what else is yet to come. 
Featured in this episode were Sean Levy, best-selling author of The Castle on Sunset, and Paul Newman, A Life. And he is author and narrator of Glitter and Might, a podcast about Hollywood mogul and political kingmaker Lou Wasserman. Always researched and written by Rebecca Lieb and Jason Horton, this episode is guest produced by Brian Fernandez. We'll take a look at this storied hotel in West Hollywood. This is the legendary Chateau Marmont. Comic actor John Belushi died today at a rented hotel bungalow in the Hollywood Hills. We are between the world. I thought something just touched me. I'm not kidding. I felt it was like a whole, whoa, whoa, like a whole energy shift. He did not die here, but some of his best moments of life were at this hotel. Ooh. I just complete shift of everything. Like we just went underwater. Yeah. So. Grace Kelly, are you here with us now? Can you show us? Show <gasps> Goosebumps all over. Oh okay, she's gosh. here, she's here, she's here. She is right by you. She's standing kind of behind you to your left. Oh Do you feel it? Do you feel oh something right there? I feel a lot of vibrating. Can you hear me? That sounded literally like her. Yeah. yeah. Have you thought of me? Did you stay in this room? You did. So that's why you just showed up. It's like all oh, only backwards, but it's pulling up that energy. We're just going to blow open the veil a little more. Oh boy. He's here. Okay, John. My nose is going crazy. Oh, wow. I'm, ooh, so heavy through here, through the head, oh so God. thick. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, I, I can hardly talk. I mean, like this is closing up. I don't know if, well, however he died, if this really closed up, like. Lonely. Oh. What do you have to tell us, John? Are you, are you okay? Are you crossed over and everything okay? It was an accident. Yeah, that was like terrifying. And like a beautiful net, see this net closing right around this space as we slowly close the veil between the worlds. I didn't touch that. Mm -hmm. Really? No. Amazing Grace. Did it. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Angie is your home for everything home, and they've made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise that you need. Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly. Which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few steps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your own home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchases, over prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.